So where do examiners award marks for graphs? One mark is given for your x-axis. You need to have drawn a suitable scale and the axis needs to be labelled with units if appropriate. A second mark is given for the y-axis and the examiner will be looking for the same points a suitable scale and that your axes must be labelled including units if appropriate. A third mark is given for accurate plotting of points if you're doing a line graph or the accurate drawing of bars in a bar chart. A fourth mark is given if you are drawing a line graph you must draw a suitable line of best fit. If you're doing a bar chart then each of the bars needs to be individually labelled. So, how do we draw a line graph? Well, the most problematic part of drawing a graph is deciding and working out an appropriate scale. You need to look at your lowest and highest values and hence work out the range of values your scale needs to cover. Once you've done this, you can work out how much each square on your graph paper should be worth. When doing this, keep your scale as simple as possible. For instance, each big square on your graph paper, it could be 1 newton, or it could be 2 newtons, 5 newtons, 10 newtons. Don't, however, make your scale awkward. For instance, having one square equal to 3 newtons or 7 newtons. It's much harder to plot accurate points when you're having to spend time working out the maths. Now once you've worked out your scale, you should write down the numbers. This scale has not been drawn correctly. So can you please pause the presentation and work out what is wrong with the two axes? So have you worked it out? There are two mistakes with this attempt. So hopefully you've worked it out. The first mistake is in the square pointing to with the arrow. This square is worth 10. Every other square on the y axis is worth 5. Now each square needs to be worth the same amount. This little mistake would cost you your mark for the y axis. The second mistake is on the x axis. Now the numbers are going up by 20 each time. However, going from 100 to 120, the number has not been drawn in the correct place. Whereas one square has been worth 20 up until that, it is a square and a half going from 100 to 120. Again, that means that that square is not worth the same as the other squares on that axis. Again, this small mistake would cost you your mark for the x-axis. Now, once you've got your scale drawn properly, you need to add labels to each axis with units, if appropriate, and you need to plot your points. This is generally done using small crosses and these crosses should be as small as possible. Once you've plotted your points you need to add a line of best fit. Now depending on what your pattern looks like it will either be a straight line like in this example 
or it could be a smooth curve. It should never, however, be just the points joined up. That will not count as a line of best fit. Now if there are any points which do not follow the pattern of the other points, you should draw a circle around it. Now these points are called anomalous results. And they are results which do not follow the pattern. Now when you're drawing a bar chart, your y-axis should have a scale just like if you were drawing a line graph. The x-axis however will be a bit different because it doesn't show continuous data. So just like the line graph you have a scale where each square is worth the same amount. In this case each square is worth 1. Now once you've drawn your scale, you should add your labels. Now in this example, neither hair colour nor number of students has units. So this shows that you do not always include units. If either of the variables, however, does have units, you must include them with your label. Once you've done this, you need to draw your bars. Now key points when you're drawing your bars, each bar should be the same width. This is very important. Another key point is that the gaps in between the bars also need to be the same width. This is true apart from one gap. The gap between the y-axis and the first bar should be half the width of the other gaps. Again, it is quite important that you get this right. Now once you've drawn your bars and you've got all the spacings correct, you need to label each individual bar. Now in this example, I've put the labels on the bar itself. This is not the only way to do it. The labels could also be below the bars, below the y, uh, the x-axis. So, hopefully by now, you'll know which variable to put on which axis. You'll be able to choose the correct graph for your data and hopefully you'll be able to draw appropriate scales and plot accurate graphs, both for line graphs and for bar charts. Now don't forget to fill in your worksheets so that I know you've watched this presentation.